Hello, Jude. Hello, Daniel, Theo, Hello. Eleni. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the world premiere of Night Becomes Day. We hope you enjoyed that film. I'm Grace Williams, the Head of Communications at Reality Learning and the chair of your panel tonight. I have some really amazing people to introduce, the first being Eleni Taku, who's the Deputy Director and Head of Advocacy at Human Rights 360. Eleni was also previously the Chief of Staff of the Minister for Migration Policy in Greece. I also have with you oh, tonight, nice. with, with us tonight, Daniel Berry, who is an award-winning VR film director who directed Night Becomes Day. I also have here on the panel, Theo Bogueas, the co-producer of this film and an occupational therapist and livelihoods officer at Human Rights 360. And of course, the lovely Jude Hewitson, who is the director of Reality Learning and the co-producer of Night Becomes Day. Jude, I want to start by asking you the first question. How did Night Become Day start? Right, now I've got to talk quickly or <laughs> short. Um, it started when Kit Sinclair from World Federation of Occupational Therapists came and started talking about she wanted a film, uh, not a film, a course, an e-learning course to train occupational therapists in a new area of working with displaced people. And the challenge was then, well, how do you engage and connect with people, uh, not just occupational therapists, but anyone, so that they will become proactively involved and want to, uh, yeah, do work or just be involved with the refugees and displaced persons? Mm. Because the thing is, this is all generally inaccessible and foreign to people. So... Uh, how do you get over that in order to get the understanding that is needed to understand that the displacement is going up at an incredible rate in the world? And um, with that, it's changing the way our communities and societies are working. And this poses questions like, how do we think about home? How do we think about community? And the pandemic has also brought those sort of questions into our laps and into our lounge rooms. So um, it was very important to actually get the engagement and understanding and overcome any of the barriers. So um, what we know about VR is that it crashes through screens and it brings you in to the shoes of the other person and it increases empathy. Now, these are all the things that actually can make something very real to you. So I decided that what was needed was a short VR film that can be used to start any meeting or any training or any communication that had this important discussion around displaced persons. And then I decided best start talking to Daniel. So over to you. <laughs> Daniel, you're an award-winning VR director. What made you come along on, on, on board for Night Becomes Day? Um, so yeah, this project, you know, it seemed like it was meant to be. I met Jude um, in Morocco, actually. Wow. Um, okay. It was, it was after my work screened um, in Cannes. And then I went to Morocco on a short trip afterwards. Um, and I showed her some of my work. And she just happened to live in Australia, where I live. So when I came back, we reconnected. And, um, you know, the dots just connected. Um, so, yeah. And she brought this project to me. And I was really interested in... Um, coming on board. Why did you, Jude, collaborate with occupational therapists? It doesn't seem like the mainstream profession which would engage with refugee populations or displaced people. Oh, I think you'll find that quite um, untrue by the end of this panel. Okay. <laughs> um, but it is because we, um, the Occupational Therapy, World Federation of Occupational Therapists and Reality Learning, uh, created disaster management e-learning course using scenarios and interactive scenarios. So that's what we do. And this is taking it that step further where you don't just interact with scenarios in a sort of a, a, a live, but this takes you into the immersion, which mm. is um, why Daniel, you know, you, you were talking, Daniel, about, you know, what, sort of, what camera to use, 180 or 360. Mm -hmm. and how to get the immersion, but still keep our focus on the content, on the stories of the, the Theo who's working with the refugees and Sohal, Narkom and Ali, how to keep the audience focused there, but still have that immersive experience. Hey, Daniel. 
Daniel, yeah. what were your personal challenges in, in doing, attempting to make Jude's brief? Um, well, you know, like, um, it was, I think it was really important uh, for me to first go to Athens and meet Theo and get an understanding, um, you know, a, a location scout. So I did that first. Um, and, you know, from then it just, you know, happened very naturally. And, you know, I felt really passionately about this and the impact of occupational ther therapy. And I wanted to do what I could to support that um, uh, by creating media and, you know, in a new medium that, you know, when watching a, in a virtual reality headset, it can be a very powerful experience. It can leave a lasting impression, but also to be able to share it in 2D as well. So if you notice, we have a 2D version and the virtual reality version. So we're able to get this out across multiple formats. So it, uh, the, the largest amount of people are able to see this. How is VR related to advocacy and storytelling? Because it's such a new technology. I'm wondering if you can um, bridge that gap for us who don't necessarily engage with this technology a lot. Well, yeah, you know, like any technology, you know, like the birth of film or something, it can be used for so many different things. And this is just another technology. So of course it can be used for advocacy. You know, the way that we structure these type of VR works, it's not like a game or an app where you go in and you're meant to be hooked in and like stay in VR. It's a very short experience where you, you enter another world and you see another point of view. You see something else. And you're not just watching it on a separate screen, you're in it. You're looking people directly in the eye and it has that sense of presence. So when you have this really powerful um, ability to transport someone to another place, then um, yeah, of course that, trans that translates to advocacy because we make people care through this art. And all art, you know, should make people care, should open people's eyes to something else. This is just a different medium. And it's a very unique medium. And I think it's my favorite medium. I just think it's so great to be able to put on a headset and be standing there. I just got a pop-up question from the audience. How long did it take to make this film? Uh, perhaps I'll just start that one. It took uh, 18 months. We, as I said in the beginning, was we went three times um, and built up a relationship with Theo and um, everyone who was involved in the film. So it was. It took a long time, but it also we collected all the 2D footage for training. So we we feel much more about the people and all the the stories and the issues behind it. Um, on normal video. So it wasn't just doing this, the, you know, the actual 3D one. So as an audience right now, we're getting the gem, this 3D gem in, in the midst of all of that 2D, or did you film all of the learning in 3D as well? No, no, we filmed the uh, 2D, most of the training um, and the cases are in 2D. And then the 3D was a special, very special part of it, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just want to throw to Eleni, um, what is the current situation for refugees globally? And, you know, what are some of their political challenges? We've seen in the documentary, Ali, a man with a disability attempting to get employment. Uh, what, what do you come across in your work, Eleni? Uh, hi. Hi, Grace. Hello, everybody from Athens, Greece. So I... I do feel, and just jumping in from where Daniel left it, that the, the VR technology is very important because, I mean, it's it's relatable in a way. So you, you just go into the scene and you see the challenge. And it's very important because the challenge is common. I, I just wanted to start by giving you a heads up to just today, uh, the U, UNHR globally published its uh, global trends report. Yeah. Uh, and right now uh, we are at a at uh, 79.5 million displaced people in globally. Uh, just to give a, 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 some context, this is, uh, this is a number, uh, a higher number than that has only been seen during the, the Second World War II. So this is how bad things are for people in terms of displacement. Uh, and if you add up to this, the, uh, uh, the millions of people that are going to be displaced because of the climate change, then we, we can have an overview of what's happening, of what's coming in the future. I'm just saying that 
so that we we all have the context that this is something global. This is not something you know that it's only in Greece or it's uh, affecting some countries. It will affect all of us, and it's something that we need to find hands-on solutions. And I think that the work that Theo and Judith are doing in terms of involving occupational therapy in that, and the work that uh, you all did with this VR film in terms of making this relatable is really, really precious in this, in this context. So in your role as director or deputy director of advocacy, what are some of the challenges that you, I guess, support refugees through in, in, in Greece in particular? Well, the, the main challenge is that it, it, the political context because, you know, the, the way we as uh, societies in the state streets refugees are, I mean, our political decisions, yes. first and foremost. What you see, uh, what, what you saw in the video happening in Greece, it's not a Greek policy, it's a European policy being implemented in the Greek borders because it's a European decision uh, to externalize and to militarize its borders in order not to receive more, more population and to push refugees and migrants even further into the neighboring countries. So in this way, the most uh, challenging thing is the fact that it doesn't have to do with the lack of resources, uh, the containers that you that you saw, for example, in the film, it's, it, it's not obligatory. You should not have containers. You could have homes. And the fact that people do not speak Greek, it's not. It's also not a, an obligatory state. People could have Greek lessons. But the fact that these integration tools are not there, and the tools that people can use to 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 get you know hold of their lives again are not there. It's it's of it's also linked to resources and to you know bad management, etc. But first and foremost, it's it's a policy. It's a European policy that's been implemented in Greece, which is the European border, to say to people that you know you're not really welcome here and you will not make your lives here. So I I feel, of course, Theo knows better the the, the field work and can further elaborate in that. But I think that the most important thing is to see. The, the policy behind this, uh, the, the, this, uh, these actions and these decisions. Eleni, I just got a question from Nicole who says, what can we do as a public generally when our politics and governance input policies that we may not necessarily agree with? I'm assuming that's what you mean, Nicole. Apologies if I got it wrong. Well, I think, I mean, what pops into mind is one, of course, we cannot help because helping people and, when I mean help is not like putting people in the in refugees uh, in a place where there are people that only need help because people do not need help per se. They need tools and they they need assistance to navigate their their realities in in the new countries they have arrived. So one is to be there and to try to be of assistance. But uh, I I also think that it is very very important to try all of us. I mean we are all citizens. And we need to, to put in the public discourse as much as possible the, fa the, the fact, the very fact that migration and displacement are phenomena, they are here. It's not if we like them or not, it's a reality. So we need to hold our governments accountable for not taking the, the deci that, such decisions. Yeah. Theo, what, what, what are your comments about this issue? Hello, everyone. I don't know if you hear me well. Is it OK? Yeah, it's great. Good. Great. Uh, well, uh, I totally agree with Eleni, uh, but uh, I would first start uh, with myself. When what do I mean is that first we need to challenge ourselves how uh, acceptable we are, how do we uh, feel, com how much uh, comfortable do we feel when we are around refugees, how welcoming uh, how, uh, how welcoming we are uh, to other people who are just different from us. And it's not about only refugees, but it's about to any kind of uh, people, any person that um, uh, is just different. So I would start by tackling my own stereotypes. I would uh, uh, challenge myself on that. And then I would move on what Eleni said of taking this piece of responsibility I have uh, 
uh, as a person in my daily life and also as a citizen, as a voter, as a, a professional that has some sort of power and also as a local uh, in my own country and uh, try to do uh, small things but so important so everyone feel that uh, they, are, they are accepted or uh, they are not at least frightened, they are not afraid. Um, back to Aneli, that's really powerful. Um, and I think that would be a, a central part of how we come to terms with the fact that displacement is becoming normal for a lot of people in the world. Eleni, I was just wondering, what are the priorities and needs for a community that wants to integrate everyone in respect of human rights? Wow. <laughs> um... I, I think that at the end of the day, what the, the main priority is to understand that integration is not something that has to do with migrants and refugees only. I mean, we, I live in Greece. Uh, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just trying to, to put it right on, on, where, on where I think it should be. So in, in, what is integration? Integration is, is access to basic goods and services. So integration is access to school. Integration is access to hospital, to education. To, a, to, good, to, we, to good welfare and to, to, to a, a humane way of living. In this sense, if we see integration in this way, I think that like integration is a, uh, is a goal not only for migrants and refugees in the Greek society, but for a lot of Greeks as well. Uh, so this is a unifying way to see people, to see things. Um, I think the priority is to try and remove the toxicity out of the public discourse. So the public discourse in uh, in Greece, but I guess it, I, 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 I'm quite sure that this is a common experience in many countries, mm. has put all of us in a competition of the poor in a way. So people in Greece feel uh, stranded of their dignity, and they it's it's very easy when you when you're pissed off because you're being you're becoming more and more poor. It's very easy to target somebody else when you have all this toxic environment from the media and the mainstream politics saying that this is their fault. So I, I, I feel that the, the, the main priority right now is to, to reassess what human rights actually are. R human rights for all is, is a prerequisite for social cohesion and for peace in the societies. If, if it's not for all, it's not social cohesion, and if it's not social cohesion, it's not peace in the society, and it's not prosperity. So I, I, I feel that the main priority right now is to really, really, really try to get the toxicity out of the public discourse, because if, I mean, and I, I, will, I will try to finish with that because I can talk forever about this issue, but it, like, see, I, I am sure that we, we don't come from, from really same context, but I think it's comparable. Imagine you are with friends, that have different ideas about migration. And then all of a sudden you say the word migration and the, the, the discussion opens. And at the end of the day, you end up talking about everything else but migration because migration is like a buzzword for all the toxicity of, of everybody's you know, problem to come into the discourse. So in, in a way we have to understand uh, that this is not the case. Migration is a phenomenon, we, we should address it. It causes, yes, real challenges in the societies, but it's something that has been proven in the history that can also be an added value to the societies. So I, I would go with that at the end of the day. Yes, removing the toxicity out of our public debate and not scapegoating people. Um, thank you for those insightful comments. Theo, um, I, in our discourse, we're not used to listening to occupational therapists. So when, when we think of displaced people, we, we instantly think medical issues, mental health issues, my first thought is not what's the occupational therapist doing or thinking about this situation. So is it possible for occupational therapists to be involved with refugees and should they be? Well, we have, uh, our profession has been involved. Yeah, it, uh, it has a long, it, it doesn't have such a long history. It's more than a hundred years. So we're not going back uh, to uh, more than uh, one century. So. Um, what we are go, what we are understand right now at this era that we live is that people uh, 
do not have the opportunity to do the things that they want or they need or they have to do, not because they have some sort of disability, but they don't have uh, the access and uh, fair opportunities to do all these things. So um, when, uh, I, when I started uh, working with migrant population and refugees, uh, I started by, uh, by covering some personal needs I had. I didn't start as an occupational therapist. So I said that, okay, I need to do something about it. And I, as I was, uh, as my clinical reasoning and my critical thinking was evolving, then I started building the notions that our profession uh, can really step on and understand what has been uh, written for, uh, for, for a time now um, about occupational justice or about occupational apartheid or about occupational deprivation. And when you go inside um, refugee camps and uh, you understand the isolation that occurs, not because you choose it, but uh, because you, uh, you have been put uh, in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a transportation means and you need to walk for kilometers to access the, the nearest uh, community and the nearest neighborhood, then you really understand uh, on, a, uh, on a really vivid and experiential way um, about what you need and you have to do. And that was the beginning. Uh, afterwards, I started working with adults and because we have, uh, along with uh, Sarah Kandardzis, uh, who's inside the audience, and we have, uh, we have started uh, working with uh, social inclusion for a long time now. And we, uh, were, uh, we were wondering what is social inclusion and for whom is social inclusion? So, and how real occupation therapists can do, uh, what we can, we can do um, something about it. And we discovered the power of occupation. We discovered about who is, uh, who cannot have access because he has mental health issues, mm. inaccessibility and uh, exclusion is, uh, uh, is really, is, uh, 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 is not a choice of the person, but is a choice of the society and of the governments not to strengthen and uh, promote integration to everyday life. So step by step, uh, with, I discovered that occupational therapy really has a, a step on to, to, to offer to and to enable and to empower people, but also to uh, uh, create tolerant and positive environments uh, in, inside the communities. That's amazing. Um, what are some of the challenges that you detect in the everyday life of refugees? Well, administration issues and uh, the results of the political decisions that uh, Elaine has mentioned earlier are one of the biggest challenges. Um, if you don't have uh, the necessary uh, documents to work or to, uh, to do the things that you need or you have to, uh, then you, uh, you automatically, uh, you are out of the system, so you are excluded, so you cannot have a, a, a life with uh, rights and obligations within the country. Um, another issue is about the, the general feeling and it's about the general um, rhetoric that uh, circulates around the communities and also around the media. So when uh, nowadays we have a great hostile uh, rhetoric, uh, we, we, words are really powerful. So from discussing uh, from uh, um, migrants and refugees and asylum seekers. We are the, we often use words such as uh, trespassers or illegal persons 
or uh, or we or uh, even the formal words are used on a really negative way. So we have also to tackle this. Now, as a, um, uh, as a person that enters a new country and uh, when it's really different, uh, a totally different country, it's, uh, we don't share a common Western uh, way of thinking and uh, some organization of the system and of the country. So it's something totally new. Uh, then uh, there is something that's called uh, cultural disorientation where people do not know what to do and how to do, uh, even the things that they were really feeling, they were feeling confident to their own countries. So uh, things such as how do I navigate myself uh, to the city? How do I find uh, services and buildings and uh, roads? Uh, to how can I search for a house or how can I search for a job and how can I present myself for an interview uh, are some of the things. Of course, language is a great buyer and of course is uh, the vehicle that uh, permits people to have um, more opportunities for inclusion and uh, to, to society. Um, and uh, really, again, we tackle upon uh, um, the decisions from the public bodies and the public stakeholders about integration. Just this is a question from the panel, Theo. What do you find most fulfilling about your work? What? Sorry, what do I feel? What do you find most fulfilling from your work? I believe this question is from Lydia, who's from the audience. What do you find most fulfilling about your work? The, the thing that we, um, that we feel when we work with anyone as occupational therapists, and that is that I am trying to answer to a challenge and to a problem, is that you, and you know, when something happens and you really feel the need that you need to do something and you're not able to uh, react to this, uh, you really feel hopeless and you really feel angry and you really feel that uh, you need to do something. So by searching um, voluntary placements and then paid placements, not as an occupational therapist, but as a person that has some sort of skills that can be used uh, to the refugee response, uh, I really, uh, I, I really find, I, I really feel uh, comfortable on that, that I can respond. Another question from the panel, Theo, from Ian, who says, has COVID helped us understand the refugees journey? Well, no, exactly. And what do I mean? Perhaps we have uh, experienced isolation that people who are restrained, uh, uh, we, we, we had this some sort of uh, experience such as uh, people in prison or refugees and asylum seekers or people under detention uh, that they live in uh, closed refugee camps or detention centers. We felt that, but this is not the case because um, COVID uh, is not about the journey. It, it, it is about reorientating ourselves to a new reality, about new habits. So in a sense, we, we have understood how challenging it might be to change even small things such as hygiene routines, um, but uh, it's just a small uh, bite. Thanks for sharing. Um, this question's for you, Jude. How, does this, how can this documentary be used in education? Um, well, yeah, so as I was saying, it's really great to have it as uh, a beginning, a beginning space where everyone can then step into the shoes so that you, uh, when people start any training, whether they're children in schools or whether they're adults doing um, higher education, working through the first bit which is getting you to be emotionally involved and motivated to learn about it 
and get the aha moment of not seeing it as something remote from you, but something like Theo is saying, you can actually do something about. Um, and so that's the where in education, I think it can kick off and go much deeper in when the rest of the um, either online learning or even face to face or virtual meetings. So it makes it much more powerful when you actually start talking and learning about it. If you have experienced this immersive and I, I would like to say as producer and writer of this program that it's interesting, go in and watch it in 3D because you will actually go, uh, the difference between that and the 2D in narrative terms is quite extraordinarily different. Even though it's the same story, it's actually your experience of it is so different. And often you miss a lot of the plot, if you like, um, when you're in the 3D because you are there and you meet Sohao and Narkam and, and Ali in a very personal way. So um, that kicks off so much, you know. Wow. Don't you agree, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, why do you think this film would be necessary to include in education? Oh, for me? Yeah. Yeah, I, well, you know, I, as Jude said, it's a very, you know, different experience and it's very powerful. So uh, with virtual reality and education, first of all, it's something that really excites uh, people. So maybe uh, as a way to educate, it's always good to uh, present something that's exciting and different and new, um, which is why, you know, I like emerging technology um, to such a degree. But also, it, like Jude said, with, um, and this is a very, you know, uh, this phrase is very common in the virtual reality industry is it's an empathy machine. Um, so I don't usually use it because it's a bit overused, but it's true because you're there and it's a whole, it's different brain waves are being activated when you're, when you're watching this type of work and it actually really helps or it's, it's, it's a different way of, of learning. You're accessing more active brain waves. So instead of go, zoning out and watching a film, you're actively engaged in this experience and you're a participant in this world. So it is a very different experience. And yeah, in terms of education, I think, you know, it's very effective. It's also proved to actually bypass some of the, you know, resistance we have to facts that we don't want to face. And it opens people up to take on new ideas that they would normally maybe oppose in their um, positions in life. One of the things, can I just ask El Eleni is that the, you know, we've talked a lot about the issues, but what about the positive things that refugees can help us all in the way we solve problems and um, things that we wouldn't have thought of before that we learn and they, they are part of the learning and teaching of this? Uh, thank you, Judith. I was thinking of, of this thing as you, as you spoke, actually. So the, the most in the most important lesson that we, we got from uh, working with occupational therapy is really the fact and the, I really thank Theo for bringing it into the, the organization in general is the fact that these, I mean, refugees are people with an agency, which is something that, you know, sounded a bit theoretical before that. I mean, it's not that, that we didn't say it, but to be honest, like working with refugees as being a, a social worker or a lawyer, because this is most of the stuff that we were doing, it's a whole different position than working with refugees and migrants from a position where you actually see them as I don't know whole you know whole people that have their own things to bring to the table when we're talking about the the, the prospects of integration and I I feel that uh, I, but especially by using this uh, approach we have learned a lot from them on how to deal with issues. Of course, in terms of survival techniques, uh, we were learning already because, I mean, we're talking about people who have crossed the sea, walked on foot, had their, their babies with them. So, I mean, one has to keep in mind, for example, that, that an accompanied minor of 16 years old coming from Afghanistan has, is, is, is very similar and at the same time, not very similar to our, our Greek 16 year old guy, because at the same time, he has the, 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 the social experience of having made the journey and make, make his way or her way here. But this is the one part that we already knew. At the same time, 
we learn so many things, not only about how to enrich our culture by combining it with their culture, and about this dual process, this 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 process, this mutual process of enriching each other's uh, culture, and this is something very very nice and productive for everybody. But also, but also lessons on how we can we can see our lives in a more you know uh, in a more concrete way. I, I just want to give you one example because this might all sound very theoretical. At some point, Theo introduced us to one of our beneficiaries who is. Uh, uh, a person with a physical disability, so he has lost one leg in during the war, and he's in a wheelchair. Uh, so the first thing that we we thought when we 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 saw that person and we tried to help him was to get him a disability allowance, uh, because this is the main you know one of the things that a, a Western oriented welfare state would think of. And he turned and said, "But I don't feel disabled. I just want to work." So imagine how powerful this moment is that, you know, it changes the, the way you see your neighbor that has a disability and you are used to looking at him as somebody that just needs help. And all of a sudden you have a person on, in a wheelchair that says, but I, I don't want an allowance. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want state help. I want to, a job. Can you help me to find a job? So I, I think this is a very illustrative example of how powerful this connection can be and this, this process, this mutual process can be. Um, I just have a response from the audience as well on that point, Eleni. Claire says, do you feel there's any long-term prospect to improve the conditions in the home country, enabling people to not be displaced and be left no option, but you know, becoming displaced in desperation? Uh, thank you, Claire. This is a very, very interesting question. So there, it depends on the country because people come from different countries of origin and it always has to do with the, the exact circumstances there. Uh, to be honest, for example, let's, let's take the Syrian population. Uh, from the Syrian population, which is the, the, like the most known and the most, uh, like uh, we, we have all seen the Syrian drama in our TVs. Uh, while in, uh, in uh, Europe we estimate right now uh, a, a number in the whole European continent, I mean, a number of Syrians coming up to one million to one million and a half. At the same time, there are three to 3.5 million of Syrians residing in Turkey and also a, a significant number in Lebanon and Jordan. I'm saying that not just also to put into the discussion the fact that Europe is not at all overburdened by migration and refugee issues. So the neighboring countries have taken much more of the burden of that, if this is a burden. But at the same time, uh, what we have seen is that people who, who, who still, let's say, hope of returning to their countries tend to reside in neighboring countries. So for example, people that would hope to return to Syria would be people that uh, that re reside mostly in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, whereas the people that have already made the journey to come to Europe uh, have already tried to make Europe their home in a way. Of course, this is very reductive. It's not about everything. I don't want to generalize. Uh, in, in, in the, we, we also have voluntary returns, so it's not only Syria. There are people that come, from, for example, from Pakistan or Bangladesh, or uh, Northern Africa countries, and there, there are returning. So yes, people do go back when they can, but it, all, it always has to do with the circumstances. Oh, it, it would be nice. I, I am sure that for mo most people, it would be very, very nice to, to return home, but uh, unfortunately, most of them cannot. And, and things get worse. That's the bad part. They, they, don't, get, they don't become uh, better. They become worse. They become worse. In building a climate a crisis that it's heading against the us. climate crisis, and the fact, I mean, of, we, we can talk for hours and I don't want to take a lot of time, but uh, I mean, we also have a lot of uh, Turkish citizens that come to Greece claiming for asylum. So it's not, in, I'm, I'm saying that the, it's not just the countries that we have open war conflicts. It's also countries that have author authoritarian regimes, the climate change. So there are several reasons that are unfortunately augmenting uh, that provoke this displacement. 
So human rights challenges all around the world are basically making it harder for people to stay in their own countries. Uh, I just want to turn to you, Theo, um, and ask a question from the audience who says, how is Sohil doing education-wise? And I know he can't join us on the panel, unfortunately, tonight, but I, and in the morning for you guys in Greece, but I would, I would like, I guess, your comments about what it was like working with him on this film. Oh, uh, yes, unfortunately, Sohail could not join us uh, because he's working. Uh, and Naka could not join us for protection reasons because he is not eligible and he needs to protect himself from uh, exposure. Um, now regarding Sohail, um, this is a, um, a, another frustrating story that uh, we can share and a positive story on the other hand. Uh, because Sohail has been has included to the official secondary education uh, at the age of um, around 15 years old, and he started from year seven. Uh, and due to the difficulties to the language and understanding the system, he needed again to repeat year seven, and then he moved to the year eight. So he beca he became 18 uh, while being with 14 year olds. So uh, this wasn't a really positive experience for a teenager that will become a young adult. Um, so, and also because of the situation and because of uh, the reality he needs to face, because he, uh, a teenager refugee, uh, needs to think about survival, needs to think about the next day, which is not taken for granted for uh, many teenagers around the world. Um, so he decided to join a vocational training in coding and programming. And uh, this was, uh, uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but for now it was uh, a really good, if not the best uh, decision for him, as he gave him uh, a solution and also he tried and he achieved uh, to reach his dreams through a, a short course of an eight month course. And he was really successful to that. He was really committed. He was studying and working for 10 hours uh, for this uh, module. And he really is creating now his professional pathway. Although he's, uh, he's still having in mind that he wants to study to MIT. So he's really uh, searching for a solution, not to repeat the year eight, but to do something uh, that will give him access uh, to an education that uh, uh, he will enable them to reach his dreams. That's wonderful. Did he have any uh, comments? Did he have anything to say on the panel? Yes. So because uh, I uh, asked him to, is there something that uh, you would like to share about this documentary? He said that I'm going to read it as uh, it was written in the message. This documentary inspires change in the hearts of the people uh, who are watching in order for somebody else not to reinvent the wheel. So um, I, I don't, uh, there's nothing to comment on that, but uh, I would like to also uh, give you the message of Nakam about what, because I was saying, uh, uh, I was asking him, uh, what would you like to share? What's the message uh, that you would like to spread with this documentary? And he said that um, it's, it's really important to never give up and we continue to roll with patience and following and protecting our dreams. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, this is the final question for the whole panel um, and it's from the audience. And it is, was there anything that surprised you or that you learned about yourself during the project? I'll start with Jude and I'll end with Theo. Um, I didn't realize quite how persistent I was as a person. Yes. Uh, that, and also that I keep thinking, you know, you've got to do big things and it's got to conquer the world or something. And really what I was taught by everyone is no, be positive, 
do what small be present and even the medium of vr makes you feel like be present and i think that's the main thing is just wherever you are just be and be positive and present and do what you can yeah which sounds all very motherhood but yep Bring, <laughs> brought me back to that and daniel what was what was your learning yeah you know i i when i first um began working on this project i didn't know what to expect um and i sh and you know by the end of it, I was inspired and motivated and, you know, just so, so inspired by everybody who I met and um, just how powerful and resilient all of these people were. And, and you know, and, and I feel like I became stronger just being in their presence. So um, it was, yeah, you know, I guess inspired is the main word. That's really beautiful. And Eleni? Uh, me too. I think a good echo be the Daniel and Judith. I mean, resilience is uh, the main lesson that I. I mean, we take every day because we also work in the field every day. But uh, uh, every new approach and every new technology that jumps in, uh, just accentuates the the already existing lessons that we we learn from the people's resilience. And Theo. Well, I've discovered a couple of things. One is that we're discussing about the resilience of people, but we also need to discuss the resilience, the resilience of the community. So, and that goes with that. What I've learned is that we keep working with people, but we really need to work with people and empower them to uh, make their voice stronger and uh, work with the communities and the rest of context and environment. So my learning is that we need also to become more extroversive as uh, extrovert as uh, therapists and professionals. And we need uh, to um, uh, promote uh, equality uh, in the lives of all communities with all people uh, included through doing and we should do that by using media by using technologies and by uh, discussing and exposing ourselves because we need to expose and use our power thank you so much theo um for everyone who is still watching the panel discussion just remember that the link to the vr is available for 48 hours so please check it out with your headsets or goggles it's really worth it thank you so much and have a lovely evening and afternoon in greece <laughs> thank you guys